Welcome, everyone. I'd like to call the uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council meeting, regular scheduled meeting for Monday, October the 7th, to order. And um, I'll look to the clerk who is substituting for Michael this evening to call the order. Chairman Walsh? Here. Councilor Guvenali? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Wagner? If you'd all rise, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> the first item on today's agenda is Town Council reports and correspondence. Is there any, anything to report? Don't see anything. Okay, so we'll move on to Finance Committee report. Anything to report, Frank? Finance? Uh, nothing to report. We'll talk about the CIP. Yeah, we have an item later on the agenda. And the financials are attached uh, to your packet as well. That brings us to the first um, opportunity tonight for citizens to address the council for items that are not onto the agenda. And if you would like to address us, if you'd step forward and introduce yourself to the podium to uh, my left, your right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Dennis Marat from Westbrook, and friend Susan Love from uh, Falmouth. We're both representing the <coughs> Greater Portland Archangel Sister City Committee. Um, as you I see you have a little surprise there tonight. The desk is uh, coffee mugs and a <coughs> latest newsletter. November 18th, coming up very quick, will be 25 years, marking the uh, initial agreement that was signed in Archangel, November 18, 1988, the Greater Portland Archangel Sister City Project. There were 13 <coughs> communities Long Island later added uh, 14 communities, including Cape Elizabeth. November 18th, we're going to be having a big celebration and recognition at the Westbrook Middle School cafeteria. That's a, the Monday after Veterans Day. It gives some time and information there. We'd like uh, as many people as possible from the town council or citizens that have been involved to uh, attend the ceremonies. And um, some of the We'll be recognizing 25 years of an incredible amount of success, one of the most successful Russian-American sister city exchanges in the whole country that's still very active. In, in the legislative field, uh, medical, photography, string quartet, uh, highway, highway bridges, uh, engineering, has been tremendous amount of different projects. Uh, also, high school. We ran a high school exchange, student exchange, for 10 years, from 89 to 99. The picture right over on the left was a revival of the high school exchange between Portland High School and School 6 and Archangel in 2011. The uh, 12 students from School 6 were invited to march in the Portland Veterans Day Parade. They honored the uh, Arctic Convoy veterans, Liberty ships, in World War II. Um, that's starting up again at high school exchange based on environmental and ecological issues. So you're welcome to look at the pictures. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact the two people on Neil Duffett or Dan Glover on the newsletter. And um, we look forward to seeing you November 18th. Spasiba Bolshoi means thank you very much in Russian. Great, thank you. Thank you. If anybody wants additional newsletters, uh, please feel free to pick them up. So uh, at the back table, if you, um, if you would, there's um, agendas back there. If you just okay. leave them there, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim? <clears throat> yes, David. I'm just wondering if we might ask uh, Deb to inquire about putting some of this information on the town website. Okay, now we move to the town manager's report, which you've all received a copy of that, and um, 
I don't know whether Deb would like to make any, any comments. Um, I would. Michael has gone, um, gone uh, digital, if you noticed, in this report with pictures, which is a little bit different than uh, we've seen in the past. So uh, he's, uh, he's trying to give us a real-time view of uh, some of the projects that are underway. Deb? Thank you very much, Jim. Um, as uh, Chairman Walsh said, Michael is doing a digital report now, which is incredibly helpful. And also, um, the same uh, day that we have council meetings, we have <coughs> department head meetings. So I'm able to uh, bring a couple more pieces of information to everyone that I think will be um, of interest. So I would like to highlight some things for folks. The Thomas Memorial Library uh, Book and Bake Sale will be held on October 18th and 19th. Hopefully, folks will be able to uh, get over to the library to support that event. The Town Center Planning Committee is holding a public forum on Thursday, October 17th from 7 to 9, uh, right here in the council chamber. Um, residents, business owners, etc., are invited to come and help the Town Center Planning Committee um, in their uh, efforts to get more public input on this subject. Um, so if you'd like to uh, provide input to them, we encourage you to attend the forum. There's also additional information on the town's website um, if you'd like to follow along as well. Um, the Conservation Commission will be holding a trail work day on Saturday, October 19th at 9 a.m. Um, the work for that day will be concentrated on the Eastman Meadows uh, trails. So if anyone would like to help out the Conservation Commission in that effort, they would really appreciate your help. Uh, for more information, our town planner Maureen can provide more information um, if you would like that. Our ordinance committee, the town council's ordinance committee, will be meeting this Thursday, which is October 10th at 8 a.m. in the Jordan Conference Room here at Town Hall. And they'll be looking at uh, possibly amending the business sign ordinance, or the sign ordinance dealing with business signs allowing sandwich board signs. We know that there's uh, several people interested in that, so the Ordinance Committee will be doing their work this Thursday uh, here at Town Hall at 8 a.m. And uh, two more things I'd like to mention. On Saturday, October 19th, the Recycling Committee will be sponsoring a paper shredding event <laughs> um, at Sounds the like Recycling fun. Center. Yes. Um, and that will be held again on Saturday, October 19th from 9 to 1. Um, and the paper and so forth will be shredded right there on site. So if folks are worried that they might have some uh, personal information, private information, uh, it won't be taken off the grounds. It will be sh shredded right there. So, and there's a three box maximum per car. So we don't know what the size box is, but I guess if you bring three boxes, they'll take whatever size they are. So Three years on the council, that's got to be at least three boxes Lots. of paper, <laughs> right? At least. At least. Uh, and lastly, the fall cleanup. Uh, at the recycling center, um, disposal fees will be waived for residents uh, bringing their materials two weeks in October uh, from Saturday, October 12th through and including Monday, October 28th. Um, and there will be four Sundays that uh, the recycling center will be open for the uh, recyclables, leaf, yard waste, and wood, <coughs> wood waste, uh, bulky waste, and brush only. And those, um, Dates are on the town's website as well. They'll be open 10 to 4.30, October 20th, 27th, November 3rd and 10th. So thank you for indulging me a little bit. There's a lot going on and I thought it was um, great to highlight that for folks. And again, all this information is on the town's website, capeelizabeth.com, if you would like more information. So thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Um, on Thursday night, I believe there's a, isn't there a thank you dinner for all of the museum uh, volunteers, Portland Head. Uh, we've all received an invitation, so I'd encourage you if you can make it. It's always a great event, and it's always nice to see the people who make it happen out there as volunteers. And then one other point uh, that I'd like to thank uh, Ted, Ted Jordan and his class at the high school for sponsoring and conducting the Candidates Night this last week. Uh, we, uh, we had one, one of our uh, Compadres here was uh, in that event, and it it, uh, it was just extremely well well done. And um, they've done it now two or three years in a row, and it gets better every year. And it's uh, pretty exciting to to watch that. Of course, I was at home with them, with popcorn and taking care of it that way, <laughs> as, as opposed to here. I'm gonna catch the replay. <clears throat> there you go. 
Okay, uh, next item on our agenda is to review the draft minutes of September the 9th. Do I have a motion? Uh, move David. to approve. Do I have a second? Second, second by Jamie. Any, uh, any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, the first item uh, on today's agenda is this uh, public hearing on the Ottawa Road Combined Sewer Overflow Permit. We're going to take this a little bit out of order from what you have in front of you, folks. Uh, Bob Malley is, uh, is going to introduce the issue, and we have a presentation that I'd like to have us receive first, <coughs> as opposed to the way we, we, it's now organized. Thank you. Um, since February 2010, the uh, council worked with the city of on the Ottawa Road Combined Sewer Overflow Master Plan. Uh, all three entities are stakeholders uh, in the process that has culminated in the development of the proposed plan uh, to eventually reduce overflows that have occurred at the Ottawa Road pumping station over the years. Uh, in January of 2012, you received an update uh, on the master plan from Wright Pierce, who were selected by the Water District uh, to develop the plan before you. Uh, a component of that process involves uh, hosting a public hearing and receiving public comment, which is the intent of uh, tonight's meeting. Uh, the plan, uh, draft plan has been on file uh, at Public Works for the past 30 days. We had a legal notice in the paper to let people know that uh, they could view it. And uh, we have not received any public comment uh, to date. Um, the plan was approved by the main DEP this past July. And uh, I'd like to introduce Chris uh, Dwinell from Wright Pierce. Uh, who will provide an overview and answer any questions related to the submission. Uh, his associate, Katie Collins, is also here who worked on the plan. And I want to thank Chris and Katie for all the work they did putting the document together. It's quite voluminous if you've seen it. So, uh, but anyway, I'll introduce Chris and we'll do a short PowerPoint and uh, take her from there. Thanks for the introduction, Bob. Let's see if I can do this here. Give me a moment. Get, to get it to show up on my screen here, so I am uh, found, found everything. Thank you very much, Bob. As, as Bob mentioned, my name is Chris Dwinell. I work for Wright Pierce. Katie Collins is joining me here this evening. She works in our Portland office. Uh, I guess it was in January of 2012 that we were before the town council at a workshop meeting, and I recognized a few familiar faces from that meeting. At that time, we did a longer presentation, about a half an hour presentation, and uh, Mike and Bob had asked me to cut it down to 15 minutes, so I'll try my best to, to talk about this in 15 minutes to give you an over, overview. Um, um, Bob mentioned combined sore overflow, an acronym for that is CSO, combined sore overflow. Um, you have one located here in Cape Elizabeth. It's located at the Ottawa Road pump station. Um, and it's jointly owned, as Bob mentioned. Uh, there are three st stakeholders, the, the town, city of South Portland, and the Portland Water District. Actually, a small portion of uh, South Portland actually drains into the pump station, drains into Cape Elizabeth to the pump station, and it actually gets pumped and treated at the South Portland Wastewater Treatment Facility. That's the collection system that you have in the northern part of Cape Elizabeth. Um, CSO has been there for a long time. In fact, it's been there as long as the pump station has been there and probably even before that, before there were treatment facilities and pump stations. Uh, but it was just recently licensed with the three parties sharing this license in 2009. That's actually a photo of the, of the pump station right there. Uh, hard to see this graphic, uh, but basically that shows you an overview of the collection uh, facilities where you have joint ownership. You have some collector sewers in South Portland to the north in kind of the purple color. You have uh, green, uh, I believe the green is, is infrastructure that's owned by the town as well as the yellow is I think owned by the Portland Water District. And it's hard to see there and I, I don't have a, is there a laser pointer here? I don't have a laser pointer, I apologize. 
Um, but basically, uh, you have a pump station located very to near Danforth Clove, which has a CSO, and I'll describe what a CSO is in the next slide. Um, it's permitted. That's a good thing. It's allowed by Maine DEP and EPA. It's a permitted wet weather discharge, basically a permitted violation of the Clean Water Act to discharge into Danforth Cove. Before you had wastewater collection facilities, pump stations, treatment plants, basically all the wastewater that came out of homes and all the stormwater that came off streets from rainfall went into water bodies all in the same pipes. Those were combined. All those things combined into one pipe. A lot of that was taken care of when pump stations were built and treatment plants were built. A lot of that was separated because you, pump stations don't do a real good job trying to capture all the rainfall that falls on the earth. It's just too much volume. But not all of that occurred. It was just too expensive to do all that separation. So during dry weather periods, all the wastewater that drains to this pump station gets pumped eventually to the family field or Little John pump station and then it goes to South Portland. But during wet weather, the, the, pipe, the uh, pump station basically gets overwhelmed. And you have an overflow of sanitary wastewater into a stormwater pipe that eventually drains into Danforth Cove. And that happens on average about six times a year during high groundwater conditions and, and rainfall events. Uh, here's just a photo showing some of the sources of the things that cause CSOs, basically infiltration and inflow. If you look down at the bottom or to the right, you see leaking joints in pipes, root intrusion into pipes, cracked pipes and such. Um, those are infiltration sources. That basically allows groundwater to get into the pipe, into the pump station. Inflow sources, basically when it rains, rainfall gets directly into the collection system. Roof drains, foundation drains around people's homes that were just conveniently tied into the sewer when they were built. So those are all sources of infiltration and inflow. So why are CSOs important? Well, they're important because, uh, as I mentioned, they're a permitted violation of the Clean Water Act. And because of that, they want, oh, thank you. They want plans. May, in fact, Maine DP being a delegated state and in charge of issuing permits here for wastewater facilities, they want to make sure that you create plans, either master plans or long-term control plans to make sure that you're trying to mitigate that CSO, that it doesn't go on forever. Um, so you are required, uh, as part of the 2009 discharge permit, to come up with a plan with a schedule and costs to mitigate to a certain level these discharges, basically to minimize them. And they required by the end of 2011 that a plan be submitted. And that was submitted uh, by Wright Pierce in close consultation with the town, the city of South Portland, and the Portland Water District. Uh, the town met that milestone, and the plan, as Bob mentioned, was submitted. And I guess it took about a year and a half to hear back from DEP. They got quite a lot on their plate. They did approve the plan, really, without any comments. Um, just a little bit about how the plan was developed. As, as Bob mentioned, it started back in February 2010, and it culminated with a report in December of 2011. Did a lot of field work. You can see a photo here of basically blowing smoke in the pipes and seeing where there was a cracked pipe underground, as you can clearly see going across that yard. We did flow metering to understand where the worst areas were, where there was more flow coming from, smoke testing. And all of the collector sewers leading to the pump station were inspected with a TV camera, as well as the manholes. Uh, so it was a fair amount, basically a very, very comprehensive look at the collection system. Uh, we also did a little bit of hydraulic modeling of the Shore Road Interceptor, which is downstream of the pump station. One of the key decisions once we collected all this data is trying to figure out how much to mitigate. The peak flow from that combined sewer overflow in the six years of data that we looked at was almost 2,000 gallons per minute. That's, that's a huge amount of flow. And in one storm, you had over 3 million gallons go overboard of sanitary wastewater. And that just gives you an idea of how much it is, a football field covered in nine feet of water. Now, that doesn't happen all the time, and it doesn't happen all of the storms. So it was going to be fairly expensive to try to mitigate almost 2,000 gallons a minute of flow. It would have required a lot more work. So we looked at a lot of different information that was out there, guidance documents, the data we had collected. And jointly, working with the three stakeholders, we determined that we would try to mitigate or eliminate up to 1,100 gallons a minute of flow to try to and by doing that, we would look at getting rid of 
almost 94% reduction in the volumes that overflow from that over time. So that was set as a guideline for this five-year plan. We looked at various options and how to target and remove 1,100 gallons a minute, looking at trying to go out into the system and replace some of those crack pipes and get rid of sump pumps and foundation drains. Just put in bigger pipes and a bigger pump station, but if you made the pump station that's that big, it would overwhelm the pump station downstream, so that didn't work out uh, as well as we had hoped. It's just uh, too much flow. We looked at storage tanks, and we looked at even having a little treatment plan at that location to treat the wastewater before it goes overboard. We looked at financial and technical uh, aspects. How much would it cost for these alternatives? Are they technically feasible? Will they be socially and politically accepted? And in the end, we ended up looking at a fairly intense program of infiltration and inflow removal, basically going and replacing not only the mainline pipes in the right away, but looking at people's basements, looking at sewer laterals to get the flow, as you saw in that photo, the flow, that, the pipe that gets the flow from the basement to uh, the interceptor in the road or the collector sewer. Uh, and that was jointly agreed upon by all of the parties working on it. And we, it was agreed to mitigate to that level in a five-year plan. And here's a graphic of the five-year plan. Um, essentially, um, looking to start next year, uh, Main DP has stated that I think in 2014, the permit that you have for that CSO master plan comes due. They're usually five-year plans, so you got it in 2009. It gets renewed in 2014, and they've basically stated that by the time it gets renewed again in 2019, we want you to have accomplished all of these projects. Uh, so essentially, starting out this year, we're looking at additional, uh, next year, additional investigation, getting into some of the basements and looking and trying to nail down exactly what the project is going to consist of and designing that project. Moving on to some additional II investigation and constructing a phase one project in 2015. 2016 and 2017 are some additional II removal projects, design and construction and doing a preliminary design of a pump station upgrade, which ultimately will become part of the next five years or down the road. The pump station itself needs upgrading anyways, but uh, wanted to try to mitigate some II and get a better sense of how good of a job we really do. And then updating of the plan. As far as the cost of the plan, um, these were in 2011 dollars and then future dollars were I think five years down the road. That gives you the range of costs to do this five-year plan. I should note that that's a shared cost. Um, that's obviously a shared cost, at least between the town and the city of South Portland. Um, as far as how that's going to affect your sewer fund, that's yet to be determined. And I think that's something that you guys will talk about, I believe, in a, in a meeting in November uh, to determine if any additional rate increases are, are needed to be able to implement this plan. Certainly going to a higher level than 1,100 gallons a minute would have been at least 50%, if not 100% more costly. So we tried to balance the environment and protection of the environment meeting DEP's guidelines with the impact on the two communities. As far as next steps, as I mentioned, DEP's approved the plan. Uh, the 30-day public comment period, I believe, has ended, culminating in this public hearing. Is that correct, Bob? Um, address any public comments that there are here this evening. Uh, we have a pr similar presentation scheduled in South Portland for October 28th uh, to do a public hearing and as well as get any uh, comments and they may approve it that evening as well, the, the city. Um, I mentioned the November meeting you might have here in Cape Elizabeth. And then ultimately we will just, if there's no major comments or any comments, we'll just change the cover out and stamp it and submit it to Maine DEP as a, as a record document. And then next year, start the five-year plan. So that's kind of a very quick overview of a tremendous amount of work that was uh, put into this project. And I'll answer any questions. So um, why don't we, why don't we uh, declare the uh, public hearing open, and then we'll come back to questions, if that's OK. Sure. <coughs> I am the uh, Ottawa Road Combined Sewer Overflow Permit Public Hearing open. 
And uh, Chris, um, if someone wants to s stand up there, you're going to have to move out of the way. <laughs> if um, someone wishes to address us on any public comment they may have about this particular project, please come to the podium. Tell us your name and your address, and uh, limit your comments to three minutes. I don't see anybody rushing to the podium. So I'll say it again, the uh, public comment period is still open. Anybody interested? OK, I'm going to declare it closed. Thank you. So um, there is no decision to be made here by the council. But if you have questions for Chris, <coughs> If you remember the workshop, it was pretty, pretty informative and rather detailed. I think the smoke testing was quite interesting as to how one goes about that. <clears throat> um, is there anything anybody want? Yeah, Frank? Yeah, just a question. Um, how was it decided that the cost would be split evenly between the paper and South Portland? Um, I don't, if I said evenly, I, I may have misspoke. misspoke. I, may have heard I think, the, I think the, there needs to be some discussions uh, between Mike, uh, Jim Gailey, and, and others in the city of South Portland. Uh, and Bob to decide, and, I, and I, I believe there's some provisions within the existing permit, and there's been some discussions about cost sharing. Certainly in preparing this, this study, it was decided up front how the cost would be shared for, to hire Wright Pierce to do all the work that we did. Um, so I think that decision is yet to be made. Um, there is a sharing of cost. I'm not suggesting it's not necessarily 50-50. And also I recall that a uh, number of homeowners in Open Cape and South Portland uh, needed to be contacted about changing the way in which their basement drains, their mm -hmm. foundation drains came in, as well as roof uh, drains came into the system. Has that those contacts been made yet, or is that going to no. be? No. And that and that's. Uh, did you want to address that, Bob? We haven't programmed an implementation strategy for that yet. So what we need to do is have our sort of kickoff meeting with South Portland, and then we start doing our I and I investigation. That's when we'll be, you know, looking at homes and uh, seeing what we have for information, and then working with the homeowners to try to reduce those those connections. How do you uh, discover whether or not they're actually connected into the sewer? Some of it's actually house to house, uh, making contact with the homeowner uh, to see what they have for connections in their basement. If they have, you know, something obvious would be a sump pump connection that's connected to the sanitary pipes. Uh, inside the house. Some of it can be done with camera work on the laterals, but that's often difficult to do. But really need to get in the cellars and see what's going on okay. to do it right. Thank you. Jamie? Yes, so for the work that would need to be done on individual houses, who's going to pay for that? We haven't determined that yet. So that's, we can have more of those discussions in November, and that's really yet to be determined. Were those connections legal when they were made, Bob? Um, this, I mean, there's a lot of sump pumps that are into the sanitary system. There's a lot of foundation drains that, by nature of the construction, were tied to the sewer laterals. Um, but I believe our sewer ordinance states that it's really just uh, designed for sanitary flows and not non-sanitary discharges. But some of these were just innocently done years ago because that was the nature of the system. Great. Any other questions on this side? No? Okay. Thank Bob, you. thank you. Chris, thank, thank you. you. We appreciate your uh, presentation and uh, a lot of work and a lot to be done going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, we want to have the lights on again here so that the TV is <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to the uh, second item on our agenda, and that's item 126, and that's the 2013 draft Greenbelt plan. Um, Jamie, as the liaison to that Conservation Commission, do you have any comments before we move to a presentation and then whatever? Yes. Go ahead. Um, <coughs> just briefly, I want to thank the Conservation Commission for the hard work they put into this, this plan. There was a lot of public hearings, a lot of public comment, both orally and, and writing. And uh, sometimes the Conservation Commission probably got uh, more than they expected from public comment. Um, but they uh, thankfully had thick skins and acted as good public servants. Um, uh, and on the, the flip side of that, the, the public had a lot of comments about the process that I think all of us as counselors should pay attention to for any future Greenbelt plan um, investigations. 
and that we should take seriously some of the comments that we've received about how to improve the process in the future. Um, I would advise all council members to uh, look at some of the case law we've received. I mean, we don't need to do this tonight. It's just um, suggestions for when we further consider the recommendations. Um, and look specifically at, I think it's a 20-some-odd, 20, 20 26-page plan or 30-page plan. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 really, the only controversy that I really <clears throat> noticed during this whole process had to do with uh, a couple of specific trails. I think otherwise the, <clears throat> the plan will be um, readily accepted and the, the hard work that the Conservation Commission uh, did on this would be uh, heralded and um, appreciated. Uh, but that there's still some work to be done on a couple of specific uh, neighborhoods. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, with the uh, Council's indulgence, um, Garvin Donegan, who is the chair of the Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission, would like a, to make a short presentation to us. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Garvin Donegan, Conservation Chair, and also um, I have Marty Blair here, also another Commission member with me. Um, again, I would like to thank the Council. Uh, the Commission is pleased to present the 2013 uh, Greenbelt uh, Plan to the Town Council for consideration this evening. Uh, it has been very challenging, uh, yet certainly rewarding to work on this document. Uh, during the Greenbelt Plan update, the Commission heard uh, approximately over 600 speakers at its meetings and reviewed over 200 emails and correspondence. Uh, that is including three petitions. The plan uh, significantly evolved uh, and changed throughout uh, the Commission's development of the plan uh, via over 14 meetings, including two public forums that were split in uh, North and South territories. Uh, and that also includes two special meetings that we held with uh, the Cape Farm Alliance and the Riverside Trustees, or excuse me, the Riverside Cemetery Trustees. Um, and really with the plan changing and evolving uh, just about after uh, every meeting. Uh, of the 23 trail links shown on the map uh, currently, uh, trail links one, two, three, five, six, and 10 are the Conservation Commission's highest priorities for addition to the existing Green Belt Network. Uh, there was healthy debate on whether to even prioritize trails. And I must emphasize as a spokesman for the commission that uh, it was uh, the commission's uh, input to say that all trails are important, uh, but it's fair to look at the highest priorities aside from lending themselves to good comprehensive planning as the commission's intent for future Greenbelt efforts. Um, for those of you familiar with our work, uh, these priorities shouldn't be of too much of a surprise, as this is where some of our past, as well as our current efforts have been occurring, including uh, some op-eds we've done in the local papers, uh, highlighting and spotlighting uh, resource allocation. Uh, the prioritized trails also represent a, vi a vision of creating a larger contiguous Greenbelt loop that utilizes the Shore Road Path, uh, Fort Williams, Dyer Woods, Lovett Woods, Stonegate, Robinson Woods, and the Town Center. <clears throat> for the Conservation Commission, and I'd be happy to point out those areas for context. Um, obviously, Fort Williams being up here, uh, Dyer Woods being in this area, Lovett Woods being further south, um, Stonegate in and around this area, uh, connecting down to the town center, and uh, priority number 10 is small but significant as it would serve to get legal public access to part of Robinson Woods and help uh, accomplish some of the great work that uh, Kelt as well as resources from the town. Uh, for the commission, uh, for the Conservation Commission, uh, the most significant part of the Greenbelt Plan is actually not the map. It is, in fact, the goals for expanding the Greenbelt Trails and open space over the next decade. <clears throat> These goals articulate 
what have been the informal guidelines that the Commission has used to grow, grow its trail network. And the conservation has looked to pass, to this date, has looked to pass Greenbelt plans essentially for guidance in the creation of our 2013 Greenbelt plan. Uh, as an all-volunteer seven-member advisory board, the Commission, as usual, does welcome and seeks input from the Council. It is the Conservation Commission's intent to work with willing private uh, property owners and to respect private property rights. Uh, the included case studies demonstrate how in 2001 uh, the Greenbelt Plan has been implemented while respecting those rights of private property owners. And uh, I guess I would say that since the last Greenbelt Plan was adopted in 2001, over 11, 11 miles of trails have been added to the Greenbelt Plan. And uh, also another uh, kind of plug for my conservation commissioners, they did want me to reflect, and I agree with them, that we're very much looking forward to getting back to our uh, kind of standard stewardship practices of the Greenbelt, and certainly appreciate uh, town council guidance through the, op through the adoption of the Greenbelt plan. Great. I see that you didn't take papers out to run for elective office. Oh, absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> so then, when I was uh, nominated and elected uh, chair, I was wondering why there was no, I didn't see any signs coming uh, uh, up to the uh, town. Great. Good. Well, I'd be happy to answer any questions as well. Um, if, uh, if we can ask questions now or however, um, what would the council prefer to ask questions now of Garvin or do we want to go to public comment and how do you want to? Just a quick, if you <coughs> go ahead. repeat go ahead. the priority list. Uh, the trail priorities, of course. Uh, trail and again, uh, I, I do want to be clear. Um, I was personally, as well as other commission members, um, a pretty big advocate of prioritizing. Uh, this is consistent with the last Greenbelt plans where there were priorities outlined. And I think it's fair to prioritize. Again, lends itself to good comprehensive planning, but also shows the Commission's intent on where we'd like to do our future work. Uh, those priorities being, uh, and again, these are in conceptual locations, trail link numbers one, two, trail link three, trail link five, trail link six, and trail link 10. That's a total of six priorities. Uh, the last Greenbelt plan had, I believe, five priorities. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are described on page 18, 19 in your packet. So. Any other questions then for Garvin before we... So I would look to the council. We, we obviously need to make some recommendation here, but if if it's okay with the council, I'd like to open it up to public comment on this. It, um, and we would use our standard rules, which is 15 minutes worth of, of public comment. If people wish to address us, it would be three minutes. And we'll just see how that, that works. Is that, yeah, Frank, go ahead. Jim, maybe it might be useful for the, before public comment to simply uh, discuss the possibility the plans for future opportunities for public comment and input to the process so people yeah. are aware of what, where the, this, this may go. Yeah. Um, the, the, the council tonight will um, consider receiving this report and scheduling a public hearing. And that public hearing could be scheduled in November, it could be December, it could be January. Um, we would not be going to a workshop on this because of the amount of work that's been done already. Workshops tend to be really done for different reasons. This would be something we would take to public comment in a public hearing, which would be devoted to just hearing from you before we would make whatever decision we want to make. So right now, what's on the table with, this, uh, with the council is the consideration of receiving this report. Again, we don't have a motion to that effect, nor a second. But that is the thinking at the moment, unless I see anything different here. David? Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree that just, I think Frank's point is a good one, that this is not the only opportunity that people are gonna have to comment on the Greenbelt Trail. Right. Uh, we will definitely have a public hearing, as Jim pointed out, November, December, who knows. I, I'm not entirely certain that we don't need a workshop 
for a site walk, but I think that's a conversation we can have after we have the public comments today, yeah. uh, after the 15 minutes. Absolutely. Great. So uh, in terms of uh, do we want to take a motion and second it and then open it up to public comment, or how do we wish to do that? A motion on uh, acknowledgment? Yeah. Okay. Receipt of okay. the report. I move that we uh, acknowledge receipt of the Conservation Commission's draft 2013 Greenbelt plan. Do I have a second? Frank, second. second. Okay. So all, let's see what, I think what we should do is at this point rather than vote, open it up to public comment and hear what people have to say. And uh, Garvin, appreciate your, your presentation. Again, stick around. I will. Thank you, know, you very much. Thank you for your consideration. Thank, thank you and the Conservation Commission for all of your hard work. We'll open this up to public comment. If you wish to address us, please approach the podium. Give us your name and uh, your address. And uh, we do have a timekeeper because uh, we have been accused in the past of allowing some people to have more to say than others. And I want to keep it as fair as possible. Hi there. I'm Penny Jordan, uh, one of the owners of Jordan's Farm on Wells Road in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm pleased to hear that the approach this evening is that you're receiving a plan and will then um, hold a public hearing at a future date. Because you have an opportunity to uh, maybe um, address the process that has been taken up to this point. Uh, the process has been extremely challenging for people people who are property owners and who have attended seven meetings in order to finally have a trail removed from a proposed plan. I think in the future that what needs to happen is that when a property owner speaks about their property relative to a strategic, strategic plan, a proposed plan, or any plan, and they ask that their land not be represented in that plan, it should be taken off at the first meeting and not the seventh meeting. There's still some trails that are uh, represented in this plan that are um, challenging from a principle-based perspective. Um, and I, I say that because if we look at uh, the plan and we look at trails that traverse farm property, farmland, uh, private property without the consent of the uh, owners saying that yes, I want this on the strategic plan, yes, I am in support of this strategic plan. If there is a farm that is represented on here that has a farm road that is now being looked at as a potential trail, that should be removed from this plan. Working farms should not be represented on the Greenbelt Trail if the farm owners have not agreed that that should happen. Um, again, there's um, also the question of that could be represented within a strategic plan. Uh, what's the policy when um, trails abut one's property and people go off the trail onto the private property? Even though they are posted, and these are posted today, and there are people walking off the trails today, who is accountable for number one, making sure that if somebody happens to be hurt on the private property because they went off the trail, who's accountable for that? What is it that's going to be represented in these Greenbelt plans and these trails that protect the private property owners when people move off the trails? I think that um, when we talk about over 600 speakers, um, I probably spoke at seven of those meetings. Um, and um, yep. and I really think that... Wrap it up, Penny, please. What? If you could wrap it up, please. I will wrap it up. Okay. I won't take the whole 15 minutes, don't worry. <laughs> well, um, I think the bottom line is, you re as you look at this plan, you really need to assess it from a property owner perspective and make sure that any private property that is represented in a trail, those people need to be contacted directly before any plan is approved. Great. Thank you, Penny. Appreciate it. Anyone else wish to address us? You didn't come here tonight just to sit in the audience and see our new, new digs. Anybody want to? Go ahead, sir. Please join us. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe I should have said my name first. Um, my name is Stuart Wooden. I live on 33 Pilot Point Road. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am one of the butters of Surside Avenue, trail number 23, and I'd like to go over just several of what I think are the most important reasons why a trail should not be developed there. <clears throat> uh, the first one is, at a recent uh, Conservation Committee meeting, one of the reasons for adopting Trail 23, <coughs> Surside Avenue, was that it would connect with Trails 19, which is the Broad Cove to Shore Acres Connecticut and, uh, connector, and number 22, Turkey Hill Farm to Surside. Uh, ocean connector. It was implied by the town planner that the owners of the private land had been contacted. In fact, the two primary landowners were unaware of the matter and are totally opposed to a public path on their private property. Without these trails, there'll be no connectivity. <clears throat> the second one, one of the stated goals for trail number 23 is that the neighborhood is underserved. In fact, Shore Acres residents have public access to a beach at Trinity <clears throat> Point and the constructed portion of Surfside Avenue is open to all neighbors for walking and recreating along the water's edge. The next one is that there is a strong legal position that the ownership of the land on the unconstructed portion of Surfside Avenue has passed over to the adjacent landowners and, um, and any easement rights of the town have laugh, lapsed. Lawyers for both the town and the adjacent landowners agree that litigating this issue would be both time consuming and very expensive. DEP approval for Surfside Avenue or Surfside Trail would be very difficult, <coughs> if not impossible, to, in, to obtain. Should a trail be approved, costs for building and maintaining it would be significant. <coughs> the next one, recent efforts to gain signatures on a petition in favor of the trail have included mis misleading information regarding ownership of the land, legal issues, and anticipated costs. The en environmental impact of the trail was not mentioned to, pe to petition signers either. In summary, why spend taxpayers' dollars to develop a 1,300-foot uh, trail in the backyard of six homes when no trail has ever existed there? Neighbors have already had waterfront access in their neighborhood, and 85% of the town residents feel we have sufficient trails already. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address us? Doesn't look that way. Okay. Anybody? <coughs> Sorry, I have to get my thoughts together. It was a very long day at work. My name's Connie Pacillo. I live at Three Reef Road in Shore Acres, a few streets over from Surfside, and um, I'm speaking in favor of adding Surfside Avenue to the town's green belt. I've lived on Reef Road in Shore Acres for 21 years. At the time I bought my property, I was very concerned because it abutted a paper street. This street, also known right now, currently as Elizabeth Way, is, was created in the early 1900s, just as Surfside was. A few months ago, the town began the process to create access for another property owner on the second half of Elizabeth Way. That process is currently in play. <clears throat> when I became aware of the paper street beside my property, it was to become something else. I didn't call an attorney and I didn't threaten litigation. I abided by the process. Why? Because the street was noted in my deed when I purchased my property 21 years ago, and I accepted that as the right thing to do. Back to Surfside and why I support its acceptance into the Green Belt. The Shoreline Paper Street was always intended, since its inception in the early 1900s, to be shared by all, not just for a select few. Two, this is the last remaining shoreline path. Too often, our shoreline is being purchased and privatized to the detriment of all. Three, it is not a road to nowhere. It is a complete loop, and anyone can enter and exit on a public street. And as you all know, in planning a green belt, you put things on your wish list, and people ebb and flow. They're either passing away or properties exchange hands. Safety is not an issue. Most neighborhoods have what we call sidewalks that anyone can walk on, and this is no different. I walk my dogs in my neighborhood, and sometimes I step on someone's grass. That happens. It's a fact of life. It shouldn't be any different here. Parking. We have a public beach that was very generously donated to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust by Paul Colomb. He has a gorgeous house, and across the street from him is a beach. It's a beach, not a walking path, so just so you're not confused. And he gave it 
to the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. There isn't an issue with parking. That beach is probably seven houses down from me. At the most, on a very hot day, when it's humid and really, really hot, you see about four cars, three of which are neighborhood cars. One, perhaps, being someone else who actually found the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust <coughs> property and said, oh, it is a public beach. So, safety of children, I've heard also mentioned about Surfside. There are many children who live on Reef Road, and the majority, exclusive of those three or four cars on the very hot day, are neighborhood folks who drive in and out. We took the question of Surfside and whether or not we should try to protect it for now and forever to the public. And we have almost 400 signatures, both on an online and an offline petition. And the petition is very simply, we are asking people, would they like to protect this and would they like access to it on the green belt? And you can see from the petition what we've asked, so it's not misleading and unfortunately you know, everyone has their opinion, but it is very clear. The facts speak for themselves. It's not misleading. Finally, in closing, I ask that you do not allow the threat of any litigation by anyone to threaten your voting process where Surfside is concerned. I live near a paper street. Just because I don't have money to litigate means that my street should be developed and someone else's shouldn't. I think that everyone should look long and hard where Surfside is concerned for to let this litigation threat hang over you would have far-reaching impact for the process. That's all. Thank Great, you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to address us? We only have a few more minutes here. Anybody? <coughs> My name is Richard Bryant. <coughs> Excuse me. I live at 55 Spurwink Avenue in Cape. I just wanted to make two quick points. One is that we've lived in Cape, my wife and I, for 20 years now. And among the most attractive things about the Cape has been the rural aspect of, the, of many of the neighborhoods and the public access to places like Fort Williams and now um, the Shore Road Trail, uh, Goldcrest. All those have been developed <coughs> um, within the past few decades that we've been here and it's been a significant attraction for us staying in Cape Elizabeth. So I just wanted to generally support the openness of the process that the Conservation Commission has gone through and that you will be going through and looking at the Greenbelt Plan. I think that's critical that it is open and you hear all points of view. I think it's also really important <clears throat> that the town continue the long-term perspective it's taken with respect to the Greenbelt that's developed so far. It's been done in little pieces. It's not been done by exercising them in a domain, but instead by exercising uh, existing public rights uh, in land and through cooperation of landowners when access was needed over private property. I think that's an important way for the community to go forward. Um, and I think keeping that long-term view in mind, if we look back to where we were 20 years ago, we've made great progress, and it was because of small steps taken along the way. So I encourage you to keep up that incremental process. Um, but an important aspect of that is make sure that we don't lose some of the public rights that are in existence in the town. In 1997, I believe, the, the Paper Streets Act uh, gave an opportunity for this town to make an inventory of all paper streets throughout the town and decide whether the town wanted to preserve public rights in those paper streets. And it has done that on two occasions so far, and we're coming up in a few years to the end of a period in which the town has to decide whether it's going to exercise some of those rights. Um, and I'm glad you're dealing with us now. I do think you ought to exercise public rights where it's uh, important in looking at the long-term growth of a green belt. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you when you have your public forum on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes. yes. <coughs> Uh, my name is uh, Marshall Goldman. I live at uh, 27 Pilot Point Road, and uh, the uh, Trail 23, at least the undeveloped portion of uh, Surfside Avenue, basically uh, runs right through my backyard. And uh, I appreciate that today you're just uh, accepting the report, so I think that... Uh, you're receiving it. Receiving it. Receiving. I, I got that. I'm sorry. 
Uh, I want to. I also want to commend the uh, Conservation Commission. Uh, I was at a few of the meetings. Um, it certainly was more than I would have signed up for. Um, the uh, the Surfside Avenue Trail is is by far the most controversial trail, and I think that uh, uh, really uh, really what the problem is, and I think that. Uh, um, is that we have a neighborhood dispute. Um, and uh, because of a neighborhood dispute, um, the issue of the paper street, the Conservation Commission drawing a line on a map, um, created an avenue to involve the city further in something that I think most of our neighbors would agree we would have liked to work out together as opposed to bringing it to this point. And I think that's something to bear in mind. That's why it's very controversial. Um, the other problem in the process <laughs> is that at the last meeting, what was very frustrating from my point of view, if I had been in, in your shoes, I'm looking at Jamie right now because I know, um, in the Conservation Commission shoes, is there didn't appear to be a set of facts that were developed independently from your point of view. I mean, I personally, I can tell you that if, if there's a public path that goes down in my backyard, that's going to be devastating to us. And it will be devastating to each one of those home, homeowners there. I can tell you that that's my opinion. I feel very strongly about it. But what the problem is, is there are a number of facts around what was the reason for the paper street to begin with? Was it ever intended to be a public path or just the street? It, does the city still retain legal rights? Has anybody even ever walked on it before this? The only facts that I can tell you, and I'm not going to, unfortunately I won't be around in the next couple months, is I've never seen anybody I personally have never seen anybody walk in front of my house until this controversy arose. And the one person that I saw walking in front of my house was taking pictures of my house for a lawsuit. And that's very intrusive. Uh, I can tell you that my opinion is that if you were to ask the entire neighborhood whether they preferred a public path, they would probably tell you no. Do they want the right to walk along the ocean between my house and, and the ocean? Yes. There's a lot of people that do. There's some people that don't. There, that's a dispute. But do they want it to be open to the entire public. I think if you ask the neighborhood and you talk to them, you would find that, uh, find that they probably would not prefer that Good. if there was a different way. Good. Mr. Goldman, thank you. I, I understand. So or you can just wrap it up. Uh, we want to get to the next uh, decision here, and we're going to have ample time to have these conversations again. So anyway, I would hope that you would develop, that the city would develop independently of one party's point of view or the other, the set of facts for which you to make the appropriate decision. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Appreciate it. Okay, so the 15 minutes, uh, actually plus, is up. And we have a motion on the table to receive the Greenbelt plan. It's been seconded. Do um, we have any discussion? Yes, Jessica. I just like to. I, I attended some of the meetings when I when I was able to, and I would like to commend uh, the Conservation Commission for their grace under fire, because they were emotional meetings, understandably so. And you know, these are volunteers that have worked very hard. We have citizens that are very concerned, and um, again, understandably so. So I think that the, that our volunteers have. Um, worked very hard and um, deserve our praise for producing a document <clears throat> under stressful conditions 
and, um, and doing their job as charged by the council. David? Uh, I don't have any further discussion about the motion that's pending, but will we then have a discussion about next steps after we vote on that motion? Well, I mean, we can, we can, we can have that. I mean, I've, I've had those conversations with Michael about what, whether we should be doing a workshop, whether we should do a walk, whether we should do a public hearing. He's not here tonight, which is unfortunate because, you know, that's the planning process, but I'm all ears if you, if you want to make suggestions about that. I mean, I'm more than happy to take that discussion and formulate strategy. If, if, what, are you, what, your, what are you thinking? Well, uh, I'm open <clears throat> to ideas. It seems to me, and as I've mentioned to a lot of folks on both sides of this issue, I would like the council together to go see, especially Surfside Avenue, that proposed trail. Yep. I think if we all see the same thing at the same time, that's yep. helpful. Rather than each of us individually going out there, uh, Caitlin might see one thing and think <clears> that's a hazard, but then we might learn another, I might learn something separately, and then we're here together trying to figure out what's up with that trail. So I, I, I think a site walk, at least to that trail, and maybe others I don't know, would be appropriate. Uh, I am interested to hear from the Conservation Commission as to its rationale on some of these recommendations, uh, uh, especially the controversial ones, um, and obviously we're going to need a public hearing. Uh, I don't want to belabor the process. I think this has been going on for a long time now, and I do think it's important <coughs> to get closure uh, so that people aren't uh, experiencing a lot of uh, angst over the issue by having to drag on for three more months. But Mm -hmm. A lot's gone into this, sure. and I, I would be uh, I'm a bit fearful that we may not understand completely the Commission's rationale without some sort of uh, meeting with them, i.e. a workshop. Um, okay. But I, I don't want to make this go on forever either. So. No, that's fine. I mean, you, you served, uh, what, six years on the planning board, and I was six years on zoning, and there was a lot of benefit to having a site walk. And because you get everybody on the same page, I know that some of us have actually walked this trail um, with n members of the neighborhood independent of one another. So, you know, there's a lot of advantage to getting the same perspective, if you will. I like the caveat of asking the Conservation Commission, you know, what was the rationale behind some of this as well, because I think that could be helpful, other than reading minutes or having it, um, you know, expressed to us by staff. So, so I, th I think that's, if anyone has any additional thoughts about what David's presented, I mean, I, <clears throat> that's where I'm headed uh, because I, I really believe the reason we're receiving this and not accepting it is because we want to move through the process ourselves and understand what we have in front of us for a vote. So, um, Caitlin, I think you were, right. yeah. I <clears throat> uh, support Dave's idea. I think. Both of them are great, the workshop jointly with the Conservation Commission and the site walk. Then I just had a procedural question. Go ahead. Um, if anybody knows the answer, if we don't receive the report, what happens <clears throat> to it? Well, um, it still exists. Um, so it, it uh, I mean, technically, <laughs> it exists. I don't think it's going to go away. Um, so I, I think it's really in terms of uh, we're trying to be deliberate in our process of evaluating what's been recommended by a citizen volunteer board that we've appointed. So to some degree, we, we, I think it's our fiduciary responsibility to deal with it, but I think in a very thoughtful way, which is what David has presented. So if we were to defeat this tonight, I think it still exists out there, Caitlin. Well, that's I, I, you know. I mean, that was, my question is the, you know, the necessity of a vote. I mean, we, we've got it. It exists. That's my point. I was just wondering what voting to receive a report actually does, I guess. was. Well, you, you, but, you can take a crack at it, Jeff, Jessica. Well, I think that voting to receive the port, report and acknowledging receipt of it allows us to proceed forward with mm. our, our study. Yeah. Frank. I'm, uh, just a suggestion or a question, really. I'm wondering if it would be possible to uh, address <coughs> some of the legal issues and try to get legal determinations on some of the questions before we go a whole lot further, whether it's the, you know, the, 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 exi the continuing existence of the paper street or but some sure. of the legal questions that we <coughs> or even the DEP's point of view on this, so that if some of these issues turn out to uh, either 
strongly favor or go against this particular commercial <coughs> street, the council will know that in advance yep. and it'll play a role in the um, workshop. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, an, yeah. an, an, another good, a good note. Um, I, you know, I did talk to Michael about that possibility because clearly there are some questions, <laughs> and we need some solid basis for whatever it is we're going to consider. So, Jamie, you had a question. Um, uh, on Frank's point, I, mean, <coughs> I, I too agree that we should dig into the, um, some of the preliminary legal questions first. Unfortunately, from what I've read so far, I don't think it's going to be dispositive. I, I think it's just going to have <coughs> a continuing question mark on the legality regarding paper streets, but yeah. uh, it bears further uh, research. Um, and as far as Caitlin's <coughs> point, I think that in general with the, um, when commissions come to us with a, a, a finished work product, we should always receive them, and then we can always decide whether or not to take any action on them, but I think yeah. we should always receive them. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Kathy? I just, think? I agree with what Frank said. I think we have to, to the extent that we can, we need <coughs> to have some of our questions answered so that as we move forward, um, whether it's, you know, the legality of the paper street and who owns it and so forth. Um, because I don't think we can move forward if we don't have some of these pieces. Now, whether it becomes, you know, whether it's unknown or whatever, I, I, I think we have to pursue that a little bit more because I, I think if we don't push through this issue somehow, um, it's going to come up again. It's going to be come up again in a year from now, two years from now, ten years from now, and um, we're just not doing anybody any service by not trying to find a way to um, work through what the issue is and, and move okay. forward. Because clearly we have, um, as Mr. Goldman said, we have two, um, two groups of people that are opposed to <coughs> each other. And so it's not unlike the other issue that we were dealing with. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to, I would be interested in some more um, mm -hmm. legal counsel on this. Good. So, Deb, you've got some copious notes here. I do. Okay, great. I do. David, you had another point. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to me if we do go to a workshop, one of the agenda items would be to invite the town attorney right. uh, to give us a primer on, on the issue. And, mm -hmm. you know, for lawyers on the opposite side of a case to say that they agree that it, litigation will be expensive is frankly meaningless to me. I mean, of course they agree on that. Um, so, I don't think that the threat of litigation should deter the council from moving forward on this. It's just we need to better understand the legal issues before we move forward. So I don't want anybody to think that we're uh, shaking uh, in our boots, fearful of moving forward just because there might be a lawsuit. That's part of the process sometimes, unfortunately. So we just need to become educated to make yeah. a better decision. Good. Any further conversation? Looks like we, okay, we can take a vote. All those in favor of receiving the Greenbelt report? All those opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. So usually after we take an issue that everybody's interested in, they all vacate the building. <laughs> yes. There are storm warnings out there, folks. I'm just going to give you a heads up. <laughs> Not like what was in here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. <clears throat> We move on to uh, item 127, which is uh, the election warrant. Deb? Uh, thank you very much. This is the election warrant for the municipal election. <coughs> Why don't wait on yeah. No, you can just wait a second or two and that's good. <coughs> there you go. <laughs> Okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is um, the election warrant for the municipal election. We are calling for two members of the council and two members of the school board for three year terms until December 12th, 2016. The election will be held actually in conjunction with the state referendum election on Tuesday, November 5th. Polls are open at 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. I would recommend that the council vote to approve the warrant as presented. Do I have a motion? Frank? 
Uh, so moved. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. That's adequate. Right? That was easy. Is that adequate? You only have, you only have one more meeting. You can at Good least job. state the entire motion for the. <laughs> no sense. Oh, come on. Anyway, we have a second. I'll second. Jessica seconded. <laughs> Okay, do we have any discussion? I guess if you could tell us a little bit about absentee voting. We are getting the absentee ballots together. They will be available this week and beginning this week. The deadline to vote absentee is Thursday, October 31st. So if anyone chooses to vote absentee or if they'll be away on election day, there is a deadline the Thursday prior to the election, October 31st. And also in the next few days, we'll be working to get um, all of the state ballot questions uh, on our website, as well as the municipal ballot, so anyone can uh, access our website for information for the November 5th election. So we're working on that in the next few days. Great. Any questions for Deb? All those in favor? All those opposed? It's unanimous. Item 128, uh, the General Assistance Ordinance. Uh, do I have a motion? Um, if you remember last year, we we moved this um, in its entirety, just we followed the main municipal ordinance that is suggested. However, if the council so wishes to send it to our own ordinance committee, and I see at least one member of that ordinance committee saying, I don't think so. <laughs> no, and I see the chair saying no. Okay, so do I have a motion on the general assistance ordinance? David? Uh, I move that the council set a public hearing on the model general assistance ordinance for Wednesday, November 6, 2013 at 7 p.m. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Notice the, uh, the ordinance committee is acting very uh, judiciously here to get this moved. Any discussion about this? Any? You, Jamie, yes. Just, just since I haven't been around that long, <coughs> council, uh, I'm assuming in the past you've been happy with the uh, the proposed model ordinances? Yes, it's, it's what we have utilized in the past and has no, there hasn't been any issues, but Jamie, Jessica? Well, they, they, they study uh, cost of living, they look at uh, economic stresses and make the determinations, and, and to my recollection, we've always um, been fine with that. So. Yeah, it hasn't been any issues. And Do they cha change much year to year? They, there was a little change, I think, two years ago, um, but uh, we, we, that I recall, felt that Cape Elizabeth citizens needing this assistance would be well served. We, we still voted it in. So, mm -hmm. so um, Jamie, I hope that yep, yeah, right. answered that. Any further? Okay. I'll, all those in favor? It is unanimous. And the, number 129, the capital improvement plan. <clears throat> uh, what you have in front of you is to acknowledge the receipt. We're using that quite, quite a bit tonight. Receipt uh, of the combined capital improvement plan to thank the finance chairs Frank Govanelli and Michael Moore for all their work on the plan. If we chose not to receive it, I'm not sure what would happen. But <laughs> it would just disappear. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, do I have a motion on this item? With David? So moved. <laughs> oh, okay. Group's getting. See, what, see what's Touché. happening? Touche. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you for saying the word. I appreciate that much. That's great. Uh, is there any discussion? I mean, I would like to say to, all, to, the, to the work that Frank and Michael did, and really to everybody who participated, because Pauline was involved and Michael was involved. I mean, the superintendent was involved. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of energy, and I think uh, it's great to see something that's in a, in a plan, a strategy that we can, we can pull out and review as we go forward with whatever the conditions are. There's extreme cooper cooperation in the steps. I mean, anytime we ask Pauline for information, yeah. she forwarded it immediately. Mike communicated with Meredith. I mean, it was really a uh, terrific <clears throat> example of, you know, joint effort and yeah. a sort of a single, single government concept. Yeah. yeah. We've been asked to participate in November um, w and give examples of our one town concept to um, area governments. And uh, Meredith and John Christie are going to be there, and I'm going to be there as well, um, representing the town council. And this is just another example of the kinds of work that, that, uh, that we're capable of and hopefully will give us a roadmap going forward. Um, 
but again, my hat's off to the, to the good work. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's work in progress. It's, you know, we're receiving it. We're not really accepting it, but it's, um, but hats off to you, Frank. Great. <clears throat> you can stick around as a consultant when we're done, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Good. Any, any further comment to make about this? Okay. All those in favor? And it's unanimous. And the last item on our agenda is, again, a second opportunity for citizens to address the council on items that are not on the agenda and seeing no one in the room. I think we can suspend that. Uh, one, um, one announcement, we don't have an agenda for the October uh, workshop, which is on the 16th. And at this point, we would be canceling that. However, given the direction that I received from the council on the green belt, we may capture the 16th as a work meeting. So at this point, we were going to cancel it, but my sense is that we'll have to be in touch with you once I talk to Michael and determine that might be an opportunity for us to get the Conservation Commission together with us and have a joint discussion about where their heads at in terms of what they come up with. But at this point, we were going to uh, cancel it. And then um, Deb would like to uh, announce a couple more meetings we got. Let's see. Yeah, just a reminder that the November Council meeting is actually on that first Monday, uh, similar to this meeting tonight, November 6th. It's going to be a Town Council caucus um, and the regular council meeting. And then on Wednesday, that is November, a Wednesday. That's a Wednesday, excuse me. Yes, thank you. Yep, the that's sixth a Wednesday. is a Wednesday, right? It's the sixth, yep. And then Wednesday, November 13th is a town council workshop. Yeah. Uh, those dates okay. uh, have been announced, but again, just reminders. Yeah. And then December, I think we go back into a regular. We do, schedule. we do. So, um, so we'll be in touch on the, on the 16th. Given the direction that you've given me today, I think we're probably gonna wanna use that time. So we'll see what happens. So the chair will entertain a motion for adjournment. So move. <laughs> you can't even say it. Second. Seconded by David. Uh, any discussion? Did you have discussion, Jessica? No, I was just going to vote to adjourn. <laughs> I bet she was going to discuss the adjourn. I don't know. She's ready to vote. It's too early. It's too early. OK. All those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. I think we got some. <clears throat>